So my name is Eve, hi, and I'm a medievalist. The first uh, thing is to admit one half a problem. Anyway, <laughs> when I uh, began my graduate studies, uh, it never occurred to me that fringe beliefs would encroach on my area of study. Uh, this changed when I discovered that some young earth creationists were attempting to use Beowulf uh, to support their specious ideas, because that's a thing. Uh, while researching that topic, though, I came across uh, a slender volume called Claws, Jaws, and Dinah Saws um, <laughs> by renowned felon Dr. Kent Hovind and creationist cryptozoologist William J. Gibbons, who I believe has also uh, since acquired a doctorate. Um, among the interesting claims in that book is the following. In 1001 AD, Leif Erikson, a Viking commander, stepped ashore on a rich wooded land which lay far west of his native Iceland. He called the new land Markland, Woodland. Today we this call this area Newfoundland, situated on Canada's east coast. During his exploration of Newfoundland, Erickson and his men encountered hairy, ugly giants that uttered harsh cries. This is the earliest recorded encounter with Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, an elusive ape-like giant. This statement is fascinating in many ways, not just the punctuation and proofreading. <laughs> it's a little odd that he, uh, they call Iceland Leif's native land. It's true, um, Iceland, along with Norway, claim Leif as a native son, and that he probably was born in Iceland, but he was probably still a child when his father moved to Greenland, and he spent most of his adult life there. He sailed to North America either from Greenland or Norway, not from Iceland. It's also odd that they place the action in Markland, uh, which is usually identified as Labrador, not Newfoundland. The sagas refer to the main base of North Norse explanation exploration in North America as Vinland or Wineland, even though grapevines have never grown in Newfoundland, and that's a whole other argument. Um, but the oddest thing, of course, is the reference to Bigfoot. I'd read both Vinland sagas, and I, strangely enough, I didn't recall Bigfoot being like a major character or a minor character or anything. However, to be fair, the Hovind and Gibbons book is not entirely reliable. No, it's true. Yeah. It's ineptly written and garbles information lifted from other creationists and cryptozoologists, often without proper attribution because apparently plagiarism, like tax evasion, not a sin. <laughs> the book did, however, cause me to wonder if this is a common belief among Bigfoot proponents. And after some research, I've concluded that it's not an uncommon belief. It's common enough that I wanted to find out where the belief came from. Now, according to Daniel Loxton and Donald Prothero in Abominable Science, The Origins of Yeti, Nessie, and Other fam Famous Cryptids, which is a much better book, yes. <laughs> um, the ground zero for Bigfoot can be traced to the 1920s in Native American stories of the Sasquatch collected by John W. Burns. This version of Sasquatch, however, wore clothes, used weapons, and was capable of speech. Uh, indeed, the original Sasquatch seems to have been an unusual large Native American. Uh, witnesses described Sasquatches as hairy, but only because they had very long hair growing from their heads. Um, Sasquatch is a bipedal, non-human ape only appeared in the 1950s when a Canadian named William Rowe described his encounter with a female creature who had long, thick arms, a short, thick neck, and hair covering her body and face. Then a few years later, a man named Ray Wallace began finding uh, large footprints near his construction sites, finding, creating, whatever. Um, and thus, Bigfoot was born, Bigfoot as we know and love him today. 
Bigfoot's history, therefore, is very short and has been tainted from very nearly the very beginning uh, with hoaxing. Consequently, believers have tried to find evidence for Bigfoot farther back in history. At one time or another, almost all mythological folklore or literary giants, ogres, wild men, or wood woeses have been identified as Bigfoot, and this includes Grendel from Beowulf, although Hovind and Gibbons think Grendel looked more like this. <laughs> Bigfoot proponents have been especially keen to have identify various Native American wild men myths uh, with an actual animal, a large hairy hominid uh, that leaves footprints that often look suspiciously like bear tracks or hoaxes. Um, often these identifications are dubious at best and rely on cherry-picked details. Whatever doesn't fit Bigfoot is sort of ignored. In addition, it's always difficult to know if folklore and mythology that been, have been passed down orally for generations uh, can really be matched to real animals. If, however, believers could connect Bigfoot to the Norse explorers of North America, they would have documentary evidence that stretches back nearly a thousand years before the first footprint showed up. There are a couple different versions of the Vikings discovered Bigfoot claim. One is so strange and misguided that it sounds like satire, but apparently it's not. Um, in July 2013, a number of websites such as Bigfoot Lunch Club, Cryptomundo, and the always reliable Before It's News, uh, reported on a five-part story by UF Digest contributor Doc Vega. The good doctor uh, begins his account by mentioning a story he remembers reading in a tabloid about a UFO encounter experienced by Leif and his men. He admits he doesn't know how this information was passed down, uh, neither do I, but uh, he also mentions that gods such as Thor with his mighty axe striking lightning in the heavens might represent ancient man's interpretation of missiles or death rays. <laughs> Now, in case you're wondering why, yes, there is an entire Ancient Aliens episode dedicated to Viking um, alien technology, including uh, Odin's ravens, who I'm wearing. Uh, they're drones, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, Thor, hammer, not an axe. <clears throat> but regardless. Despite his vague memories of an article he read in the 1990s whose source he doesn't know, uh, he's able to give a, quite a detailed and fantastically wrong-headed account of aliens leading Leif and his men to the new world. Uh, but after the alien encounter, Vega moves on to Bigfoot. As Guy Edwards summarizes the argument on Bigfoot Lunch Club, is it possible that a tenth, and by the way, in Ancient Aliens, the answer to that question is always no. Um, is it possible that a 10th century historian could have documented a fierce battle between Vikings and Bigfoot? Ahmad ibn Fadlan uh, was an Arab ambassador that was captured by Vikings during a diplomatic mission. The Vikings, comma splice, the Vikings allowed him to chronicle their adventures. He called them men of the north, and his depiction of a Viking ship burial is often references and considered accurate. Other aspects of his adventure border on the fantastic, including a battle with mist, monst mist monsters, or as the Vikings called them, the Vendel. Speculation on the Vendel is all over the place, from pure fiction to the last remaining Neanderthals. Michael Crichton's author of Jurassic Park and Westworld depicts the Vendel in his screenplay, The 13th Warrior, as humanoid cannibals who appear as live like and identify with bears. For Doc Vega of UFO Digest, the Vendel may be Bigfoot. Doc Vega has written a five-part series on the topic with commentary that includes references to Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, Grover Krantz, and heavily on Lloyd Pye. Now, Ibn Fadlan did exist, and he did write about his encounters with the Viking Rus on the Volga River. He described their hygiene habits, which he found disgusting, and he did provide a valuable description of a Viking ship funeral. But that's pretty much as far as his account actually goes. The Viking, <clears throat> the battle with the Vendel comes from Michael Crichton's 
novel, uh, The Eaters of the Dead and the 13th Warrior, a movie based on the novel. It's not a documentary, it's fiction. Crichton took Ibn Fadlan's descriptions of the Rus as the foundation for his story. He included stodgy, pedantic footnotes from a fictional editor uh, and a bibliography filled with scholarly works supposedly written by people whose Latin names translate to things like, basically, hoaxy McHoax face. <laughs> the first part of the novel is a fanciful elaboration on Ibn Fadlan's writing, but the bulk of the novel, including the battle with the mist monsters, is a retelling of Beowulf, uh, which is also fiction. Just <laughs> anyway. This version of the Vikings' encounter with Bigfoot is uh, absolutely bonkers uh, and could be debunked with a quick look at the Wikipedia entry for the 13th Warrior. Curiously, despite quoting the Wikipedia entry for the 13th Warrior, uh, somehow Guy Edwards didn't quite see the problem with Doc Vega's argument. Again, it's so absurd, it seems like it has to be a joke, but people have taken it seriously. But a more typical and comparatively sane account of the Vikings' encounter with Bigfoot appears in the a and &E program Ancient Mysteries, first aired in 1994. The oldest account of Bigfoot was recorded in 986 AD by Leif Erikson and his men. During their first landing in the New World, the Norsemen wrote about monsters that were horribly ugly, hairy, swarthy, and with great black eyes. Though brief, this account contains several typical features uh, and seems to have served as one of the main sources for claims uh, that the Norse encountered Bigfoot. One point that recurs is the description of the creatures. This is sometimes placed in quotation marks to suggest that it comes from a primary source. The wording very slightly, but horribly ugly, hairy, swarthy, and with great black eyes is typical. In addition, we are provided with three, three important facts. According to this account, the encounter took place in 986 CE, Leif led the expedition, and the Norsemen recorded the encounter in writing. What's interesting about this is that even ignoring the big hairy ape in the room, all these statements are wrong. <laughs> uh, our main sources for information about the Norse expeditions to North America come from archaeological excavations, uh, particularly at Launce Meadows in Newfoundland, and the two Old Icelandic Finland sagas, Greenlander saga, and Eric the Red saga. Now the sagas, of course, uh, are not entirely reliable historical documents. They were written down hundreds of years after the events described. Um, they share characteristics with historical novels. They contain supernatural elements. There's zombies, there's a Viking Age, Sylvia Brown, etc. And they contradict each other in significant details. However, it's possible to trace a general outline of events, and these have, to some degree, been corroborated by archaeology. In addition, they are the only detailed accounts we have of the North, Norse expeditions to the New World, and they contradict these facts in pretty much every way. The show dates the discovery to, of Vinland and Bigfoot to 986, which is really precise. It was one of the things that I found most curious. It's really precise, and it's wrong. Uh, we don't know the exact year Leif first visited Vinland, but the Norse sources seem to place it very near the time Iceland uh, converted, officially converted to Christianity. And the conversion may have occurred in 999, but Icelandic sources always place it in 1000. I was puzzled by the year 986, which appears repeatedly in stories of the Norse and, of the Norse and Bigfoot. Uh, but although I haven't figured out the immediate source of the error, I think I've discovered the ultimate source. In Islendinga book, the Book of Icelanders, which is the earliest extant history of Iceland, written in the early 12th century. Ari Thorgelson explains that Leif's father, Eric the Red, began to settle Greenland 14 or 15 winters before Christianity came here to Iceland. Thus, Greenland, according to Ari, was settled in 985 or 986. That information then traveled to Landnama book, 
the Book of Settlements, more detailed early history, although the earliest versions of that are not extant. Um, and then from Landnama book to the sagas. Uh, both Eric's saga and Greenlander's saga in their present form actually copy Landnama book verbatim in their early chapters. Other sagas contain the same information, and at least one Erbigya saga says specifically that Eric settled in Greenland 14 years before the conversion of Iceland in 986. I don't know how Eric became life, Greenland became Vinland, or settlement became discovered. Uh, but this is the only explanation I can come up, up with. There is, however, a connection between 986 and Vinland, sort of maybe. Greenlander Saga says that the first man to sight Vinland was not Leif Erikson, but Bjarni Herjolfsson. Having returned to Iceland from Norway, Bjarni discovered that his parents had moved, leaving only the forwarding address, Greenland. Instead of taking a hint that it might be time to sort of move out, uh, he, just, he got his men back together and decided to sail off to Greenland, uh, apparently with quite vague instructions. West. Um, this voyage may indeed have uh, occurred around 986. And he ended up lo losing his way, and he saw various lands uh, that didn't match the description of Greenland that he'd heard, so he said, well, we're not landing here, and would go on until they got to Greenland. Um, it's possible um, that, and now the saga says he refused to land, so he couldn't possibly have seen Bigfoot. Um, of course, it's possible that uh, over time his accomplishment was minimized uh, to give Leif greater importance, um, in which case perhaps he did land. He probably didn't see Bigfoot. But regardless, uh, we have no account of him uh, in Vinland, uh, no, so no descriptions of flora of, or fauna he might have seen. And more importantly, Bigfooters are completely unaware of his existence. Leif Erikson, is the Norse explorer we've all heard of. A brown, bronze statue of mini-skirted breast-plated Leif was erected in Boston in 1887. A copy graces Milwaukee's Juno Park. Uh, a statue in Chicago's Humboldt Park commemorates the Scandinavian hijacking of the 1892 Columbian expedition. There are also Leif statues in Los Angeles, Seattle, where they've spelled his name in the Norse way, in rune-like letters, uh, Duluth, Minnesota, Waltham, Massachusetts, New Rochelle, New York, Brooklyn, New York, Minot, North Dakota, Cleveland, Ohio, Newport News, Virginia, and outside the Minnesota State Capitol in St. Paul. Reykjavik's extremely impressive statue of Leif, looking out to sea from the front of Hallgrim's Kirkja, was a gift to Iceland from the United States. According to the sagas, however, Leif, like Bjarni, could not have seen Bigfoot. Uh, his single voyage to Vinland is described very briefly in the sagas. In Eric the Red's saga, it's Leif, not Bjarni, who gets blown off course uh, and inadvertently discovers Vinland. According to the saga, Leif was traveling from Norway back to Greenland on a mission from Gad. Um, well, actually, it was a mission from uh, King Olaf Tryggvason. Olaf wanted him to convert Norway to Christianity. This explanation is almost certainly mistaken. Uh, in the many, many Norse and Latin biographies of Olaf, he's usually credited with having converted five lands, Norway, although it ended up having to be reconverted by Saint Olaf uh, Haraldsson, Iceland, Orkney, Shetland, and the Faroes. A 12th century Icelandic monk, Gunnlaug Leifsson, seems to have added Greenland to the list um, in a mostly lost Latin life of Olaf. Many later er uh, writers followed his lead. Uh, some, though, still said Olaf, Olaf converted five lands, but then list, they list six, with Greenland being the sixth. Regardless of the accuracy of the saga, though, it describes Leif's experiences in Vinland in just a couple of sentences. He saw self-sown wheat, 
maple trees and the grapevines which gave the land its name. It, there's no mention of any member of the animal king group, kingdom whatsoever. In Greenlander Saga, Leif intentionally seeks out the land Bjarni had sighted, and he does see some animals. Salmon. They're described as being larger than any he had seen before, but they're not hairy, and their feet aren't even described. <laughs> uh, if the Norse encountered Bigfoot, the meeting could not have occurred during the voyages of Bjarni or Leif. The expedition of Thorfinn, Carl Sefni, uh, is more likely. Uh, though he's less famous than Leif, a statue of Thorfinn by Icelander uh, Einar Janssen graces Philadelphia's Fairmont Park. It apparently attracts white supremacists because we can't have nice things. <laughs> Unlike Bjarni and Leif, Thorfinn and his followers were prepared to settle in Vinland. They brought domestic cattle and women, uh, though not enough women. But there are problems. Uh, Thorfinn's wife Gudrid gave birth to a child in Vinland, and Leif's half-sister Freydis memorably fought off angry natives while bare-breasted and heavily pregnant. Uh, the final assertion made by Ancient Mysteries is that Leif and his men kept a journal of their experiences. If this were true, we would have a first-hand eyewitness testimony of big, a Bigfoot encounter from over a thousand years ago. Alas, this is not the case. The first explorations of Vinland uh, seem to have roughly coincided with the conversion of Iceland and Greenland Christianity. And one of the perks of conversion is a brand new shiny alphabet. Well, slightly used alphabet. But while the Icelanders took to literacy with wild abandon, just lunatics with uh, the literacy, the adoption of literacy obviously didn't happen overnight. It took hundreds of years. So the stories circulated orally for centuries before being written down, well after the deaths of all the explorers. Of course, the Norse did have the runic Futhark, but runes are carved, not written, and sensible mariners don't schlep around a bunch of boulders <laughs> to use as a ship's log. Um, so despite the obvious inaccuracy of these statements, they get repeated over and over uh, in works dedica dedicated to footnotes, or to Bigfoot. The same facts appear again and again, often with even more improbable embellishments. A, a comparatively uh, sane version is uh, from Bigfoot, the true story of apes in America, uh, in which cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman says, in AD 986, Leif Erikson wrote of encountering monsters that were ugly, hairy, and swarthy with great black eyes. In Bigfoot, fact or fiction, Rick Emmer, uh, who also identifies Grendel as a possible Bigfoot, says that Leif and his men reportedly encountered ugly, hairy beings that they called scale rings. Some people think the scale rings might actually have been Bigfoot. It's possible, however, that Native Americans wearing huge or large animal skins fooled the Viking observers. If Emmer, Emmer is correct that Native Americans pranced about in animal skins to fool the uh, Norse, this encounter would be the very first Bigfoot hoax. <laughs> the Gulf Coast Bigfoot Research Organization reports on its website that it's a little known historical fact that the first Sasquatch encounter was perhaps observed by the Vikings who settled on the island of Newfoundland in eastern Canada. Leif kept a record of his journey across the Atlantic from Iceland to Greenland and of his experiences whilst in Newfoundland, the last point of land on his voyage. Among his accounts, Leif told of seeing huge hairy men who towered over him and his berserker crew, and the Vikings were known to have been large men. The huge hairy men, according to Leif, lived in the woods and had a rank odor and a deafening shriek. Apparently, Leif had several sightings of the huge hairy men, before departing the island. Description of creature, towering height, hairy, man-like, rank smell, deafening, deafening verbal tones. Leif's accounts spoke of his meeting of a race of men separate from the huge hairy men, which were almost certainly the Beothuk. In this account, the non-rating Norse explorers have become not only Vikings, but berserkers. <laughs> 
And the creatures they've encountered are not only hairy, but huge. Indeed, the phrase huge hairy men appears in quotation marks three times, as if it comes from a definable source, presumably like Erickson himself. Aside from growing, the creatures have become foul smelling, like the skunk ape, uh, an odiferous Bigfoot like creature said to inhabit Florida and the southern United States. They also now make blood curdling cries in accord with supposed Bigfoot vocalizations recorded by various Bigfoot hunting groups. Sharing elements with both Emmer and the Gulf Coast Bigfoot Research Organization, Crypto Guy on Crypto Sightings says, back in 986 CE, the Vikings led by Leif Erikson found themselves on the east coast of North America, which may have lead to the oldest account of Bigfoot ever recorder, recorded. Erikson and his Viking people reported sightings of a creature that they described as being hairy, hairy horribly ugly, and swarthy, having huge black eyes. Leif also described these creature as hairy men, having a terrible smell and making loud, piercing shrieks. They gave this creature the name Skelring, and many believe that this creature they encountered is what we know today as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Many believe this to be the first ever recording of a Bigfoot sighting in North America. Other believe that these descriptions may have a totally different explanation and were not Sasquatch or any other mysterious creature. Some think that these reports were, are possibly just the aboriginals of the area playing tricks on the newly arrived Vikings by wearing large animal hides. A video posted variously by Disclosed TV and Sasquatch, Sasquatch Central provides a compilation of unsourced quotations about the Vikings and Bigfoot. One borrowed nugget it covers familiar territory, but rather charmingly adds an erroneous parenthetical citation. Vikings led by Leif Erikson made their way to the east coast of North America in 986 CE. It was there that they reported seeing an horribly ugly, hairy, swarthy, and with big black eyes, Erikson, Leif, 986 CE, creature. They called the creature Skelring. People believe that the creature Skelring is what we now know today as uh, Bigfoot. But it is possible the aboriginals were playing a prank on the Vikings. Sasquatch Chronicles also very clearly notes that the huge man-like beasts that were found uh, were loud and foul-smelling were clearly distinct from native peoples. While various elements get added to the story, certain details remain constant. 986, Leif Erikson, the written eyewitness account, and some variant on the description, horribly ugly, hairy, swarthy, and with great black eyes. While not a constant, the term Skelring makes frequent appearances. So, where did the story come from, if not from the sagas? I believe a &E's Ancient Mysteries was influential since it contains all the core elements, but I suspect that the program source was the 1975 book, The Search for Bigfoot, Monster, Myth, or Man by Peter Byrne, who appears in Ancient Mysteries, though he doesn't discuss the Norse explorers. In his book, Byrne draws on the work of historian Samuel Eliot Morrison in his book, The European Discovery of America, The North Northern Voyages, although uh, Morrison definitely does not mention Bigfoot. Uh, Byrne refers to Morrison's account of the Norse discoveries, particularly, he says, an encounter by Leif Erikson and his men during their first landing in the New World with creatures that were pictured as horribly ugly, hairy, swarthy, and with great black eyes. While Byrne admits that the case is borderline and that the creatures were probably simply Indians, he still thinks they may have been Bigfoot. Why? Because they were hairy. <laughs> The Norse word skelring is a term of contempt. It means roughly a barbarian. But what, my, what caught my eye was the word hairy. The Norse were a hairy people themselves. Big men with matted hair and beards. Why did they remark on the skelring being hairy? Was it because they were very much hairier than the Norsemen? Even covered with hair, perhaps? If the encounter had been between, say, Tibetans, who are not a hirsute people, and the skell ring, one could understand the reference to hairiness, but why the Norse mention? 
In other words, the case for the Norse encounter with Bigfoot depends on the adjective hairy. Um, this is a perilously fragile foundation on which to establish a history of Bigfoot. Uh, but other writers have managed to do so by ignoring Burns' doubts and avoiding his tendency here to cite a credible source. And what of Burns' source, Samuel Eliot Morrison? Well, Morrison had a PhD in history from Harvard University and taught history there for 40 years. In his account of the Vinland voyages, Morrison essentially retells the sagas, um, sometimes conflating them. And although he lists manuscripts and some editions and translations in his bibliography, it's not, not clear what translation he's using or if he's using his own translation. Um, it's not always clear what saga he's quoting from, whether it's Greenlanders or Eric the Reds. He includes some information that's definitely false. Uh, he says, for instance, Eric the Red left Norway for Iceland to escape punishment for manslaughter. And Eric's the, uh, Eric's saga does say Eric and his father left Norway because of some killings. Uh, most historians agree that Eric would have been a child and too young to be, have been involved in those killings. Morrison also interprets and embellishes some parts of the sagas. He says that Leif considered Heluland or flat rock land, here identified as Baffin Island, worthless after finding no gold in the rocks. Um, as far as I know, neither saga mentions the lack of gold in the rocks at all. Um, so Morrison's account is eccentric or at least kind of dated, but in general it's a solid work of scholarship. Is there any justification for thinking Leif might have met Bigfoot based on Morrison's book? No. Uh, first, Morrison mentions no encounter between Leif and any sort of animal or native person, nor does he mention Bigfoot. Second, the off, often quoted description uh, of what Morrison calls the Skrellings, not Skellrings, as horribly ugly, hairy, swarthy, with great black eyes, is not in quotation marks which means it's a paraphrase in Morrison's own words, not a quote from the sagas. Um, more importantly, he applies this description to the natives, uh, very specifically to the natives uh, encountered by later expeditions. It would take a huge amount of determination and delusion to find Bigfoot in Morrison's description. The Skralings, the actual word used in the sagas, speak they use weapons, uh, arrows, and some sort of catapult. They row and presumably build skin boats. They uh, also bring a variety of animal pelts to trade with the Norse. And all this is clear from Morrison's account. As for the description of the Skralings, which inspired Byrne to think of Bigfoot, it's a pretty close paraphrase of a description in Eric's saga. This is obviously the Norse. But all the main, the important words uh, have equivalents in English. So the English word ill derives from the Norse word it, which means ill, bad, evil. So the Skralings themselves are itleliger, ill looking or ill favored. And the hauer on their hudi um, is also it. So they were dark men and ill-looking and had ugly hair on their heads. Mm -hmm. They were large-eyed and broad-cheeked. So the excessive hairiness that so fascinated Byrne is just hair the Norse considered ugly, possibly because it was black. They really did prefer blonde hair, particularly on women, though. And it's not body hair. It's very clearly not body hair. The description says they had bad hair on their heads. <laughs> the case is similar to what happened to the Sasquatch. Uh, the original Sasquatch was a large and long-haired Native American. But the transformation here is even more extreme um, because the Norse considered their hair ugly, but the sagas don't even mention that it was particularly long hair. Um, nor are the Skralings called large, although Greenlander saga uh, says one individual um, is tall and handsome. But there's no suggestion that he's inhumanly tall, uh, quite the opposite, perhaps. Uh, the passage Morrison paraphrases 
is from the Hoek's book manuscript of Eric's saga. The other manuscripts, uh, Scalholt's book, describes the Skraelings as smallier, small, rather than svartier, black or dark. So the huge hairy Bigfooty Skraelings were neither large nor particularly hairy. So how did humans become Bigfoot? Well, first Morrison retold the sagas in a slightly odd way. Burns seized on one word and ignored everything else Morrison said um, while making several mistakes. Others dismissed Burns' reservations but repeated his mistakes. And then, because why not, they added their own. Uh, and anyone, by the way, who uses the word scale ring has clearly gotten the information either directly or indirectly from Burn. Um, Old Norse, how it's anglicized, Morrison's, and then Burn, which is wrong. Uh, the same mistakes get repeated religiously until they become established fact. Fact. Um, and no one, not even Burn, bothers to look at the actual sagas. Now, I realize, of course, it's unreasonable to expect Bigfoot hunters to look at the sagas in Norse. However, <laughs> Good translations are easily, conveniently, and cheaply available. There are two different, um, I think, penguin translations that are still in print. One you can get on Kindle. Um, and they're certainly more conveniently and cheaply available than Morrison's book, which I had to get through interlibrary loan. It wasn't available at my local university library. Uh, so had Byrne or any of his followers done some responsible research and looked at the primary sources on which their claims are based, they would found that there's absolutely no justification for identifying the Skraelings with Bigfoot. However, in Eric the Red Saga, they would have found a uniped. This creature, seen hopping across Vinland, shoots an arrow at Thorvald, one of Eric the Red's sons, killing him. His men sail north and spot what they think is Uniped land, because why not? <laughs> uh, the Uniped isn't described in detail. It's not called large. It's not called hairy. It's certainly not a bipedal ape, uh, for <laughs> obvious reasons. We don't even know how big its foot is. But it's a better and less offensive match to huge, hairy, smelly, loud, Bigfoot, than Native Americans are. Thank you.